What up, Sea of Red? You're listening to Into the Flames, a Calgary Flames fan podcast. Your home for all things Flames and updates around the NHL. With your hosts, Raja Burry and Noah Eppleston. Into the Flames. New episodes every Sunday. He's like looking through all the budgeting for the past five years. It's like you've sunk like three hundred million dollars into leadership metrics, proprietary data. What are you doing? That's how they. That's how they worked out their Mike Smith contract. Probably was based off of the the leadership statistics, proprietary data. Let's be real here. Holland still uses it too. It's fine. Oh, absolutely. He's using it as we speak right now to sign. God knows who. Like yeah, you- I, I shared this stat with you. I thought it was funny because a lot of the Oilers Twitter guys were like, oh, the only like the old, like McDavid and Dreisaitl and Bouchard still finished like top 10 in scoring or whatever. And it's like, yeah, they're the only players who finished top 10 in scoring who were also like negatives in terms of plus minus in the playoffs. It's like, how do you score? It's like that game where Dreisaitl had four goals and it was like plus one. Incredible. Incredible. But you put this up on your story a while back, but you've got Chris Snow, God bless him, Vice President of Data Analytics, David Johnson, Database Architect and Analyst, Michael Charon, Quantitative Analyst, and then Hendrix Haynes, who you just brought in from Kitchener, Developer and Data Scientist, dude smart, he's three years older than me and he's already more accomplished, so we've got that going. He's younger than me and he's already more accomplished, so... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and uh yeah so we've got a boost in the analytics department which is nice to know that we actually have one that's kind of being built yeah not stone age um you know what are all these numbers here don <laughs> well that tracks leadership and that tracks hits and those are really all that matters and that tracks how good you are in the room fun 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 for 60 it's like I don't like this guy. His jokes per 60 metrics are down. He brings it down with him. That's how they hired coaches the past five years before they hired Daryl. Jokes per 60. That's right. (laughs) Speaking of coaches, how are we feeling about Huska? Yeah, like, uh, I'm going to be the old curmudgeon that's like, I'm happy for him, sure. And he seems like a really smart guy, but it's, it's the same it's the same as I feel with Conroy. Not quite the same as I feel with Conroy because, you know, it's Craig Conroy. I'm much more excited about Craig Conroy. Um, but it is kind of the same, like, wait and see. Like, I'm firmly still in the in the wait and see camp, right? Like, because, um, yeah, the press conference was good. They're saying all the right things. But, I mean, the press conferences are always good. It's like Glenn Galton was good. Everyone was like, oh, yeah, he's going to be smart and he's going to do a good job. And same with Bill Peters and and – not same with Jeff Ward. I think everybody except Brad Tree Living knew that that was going to be a disaster. But it's just like, yep, okay. Why is it going to be different? Same thing I said with Connor. Is like, how? Why is this going to be different? Like, because you have so many examples of um, recent examples, right? Gullison, Ward, Peters, of all guys who came in and couldn't really bridge the gap between, like, I would say maybe like amateur coach and legitimate excellent NHL coach. And then, I mean, if you're if you're a longtime Flames fan, you have this history of like you can even go back to like Jim Playfair and, and, and even before that, like Greg Gilbert, like back in the day, like we've seen this happen before. Why is Huskin going to be different? And I mean, you can't. It's unfair to lay that on his feet and be like ascribe to him the failures of Glenn Gullitson and the failures of Jeff Ward and mm-hmm. Jim Playfair and and all these other guys who preceded him. That's not fair to him. I'm not doing that. I'm just saying if you're a Flames fan and you're looking at this going like, yeah, I I've seen this play out before and it hasn't worked. I think that's a fair assessment. That's kind of where I'm at. Like I think he's a smart guy. I've liked what he's had to say, but it's just kind of like well, let's see, I guess. Like you have to prove it to me sort of thing and that seems like a cop-out and not great analysis but and it is kind of funny too like because it's kind of like when they announced it i was kind of like somebody tell me how to feel you know like the internet thing is like somebody why should we be mad or why should we be happy about this someone tell me either or i i really don't have any strong feelings one way or the other um I know a lot of people are upset it's not mitch love i the feeling i do have is i i think i'm glad it's huska over love um, just, you know, I think he experience is a factor in this that I think is important. 
but I, I don't have one strong feeling the other one way or the other. I, I hope he can do a good job. I think my my concern is more upstream as opposed to coaching. So I mean, like, I think he's a good guy. I hope I'm rooting for him. I hope he absolutely fucking nails it out of the park. But you know, it, it, you still have to ask the question: Why is he? How is he going to be the coach who is like makes it as an NHL coach when we've seen five or six other guys not do that? It's also kind of ballsy because like a rookie GM hiring a rookie coach, yeah. like first hire, like you don't. You don't see that. Um, I guess, like, based off of if you look at, like, last four years, I guess, as an aggregate, the areas that were strong in regards to, like, five-on-five five defensive metrics and the penalty kill, especially the last two years, um, Huska straight up responsible for that. So you look at, like, certain areas of what he was in charge of, and even when he was, like, the head coach in Stockton in that one year where they were in – Adriondak. God, where even is that place? Like it's in, uh, it's in New York, I guess. Yeah, but I mean, I, I mean, honestly, it's like way like I remember the the thing they always said about Stockton, because I always heard this. It was like, well, it is, right? Like you can look it up. Like one year it was like the murder capital of the USA. Yeah. And it was like, it was like, holy shit, nobody wants to go to Stockton. <laughs> and like you have that sort of, I guess taking a look at guys like Shillington, Anderson, Manjapani, guys that he had when they were in the A. And, like, Anderson has been very public, too, about their relationship, how it started. Just looking at the strides that they've made and stuff, it's like he's had a hand in that. So I guess just looking at his history within the organization already, although it's, like, a limited history, pretty yeah. I'm, like, a very glass half full type fan even though i get hurt every year it's really weird like i keep wanting to believe that they finally figured it out and that i won't be going through 82 games of pain and then it's like no just kidding you're we're back to a year in year out again yeah see Um, you're you're what i'd call the member of the fan i used to be there too like i described it as a it's like a toxic codependent relationship right it's like the flames are the significant other who are always like engaging in terrible behaviors and, and cheating on us and doing all these terrible things. And we're always like, Hey, we're, I'm done. I'm done with you. We're done. We're done. And then they, every single time, right. They come back to like, we've changed, we've changed. Take me back, please. We've changed. I promise this time we've changed. It's not like the other 10 times when, when you dumped me and I said, I've changed and he took me back and I hadn't changed this time is different. And we're like, yes, it is different. I'll take you back. And then it's not different. So I understand. Like, I hope he absolutely knocks that out of the park because I'm rooting for him. I feel like from an articulation standpoint, he seems to be more articulate than Glenn Gullitson. Just listening to him speak. I like went back and I was like, after the presser, I went yeah. back and watched a few Gullitson interviews. And I was like, Huska inspired more confidence in the 35 minutes that he was on the podium yeah. than any sort of indication that Gullitson gave me over the two years that he was head coach. And I think a lot of it also has to do with the fact that, like, I think deep down, it's kind of crazy to say, but, like, I I feel like deep down, Gullitson and Jeff Ward both knew they they were in way over their heads. Oh, totally. So I, I didn't even think deep down. It was like, you would see it. <laughs> it was like, it's like they'd ask, they'd ask Jeff at a press conference, like, what went wrong? And he was just like, <laughs> uh, compete level. Like, you, this poor guy. Put him out of his misery. <laughs> Yeah, and just like seeing Huska talk about, I guess, how he feels that he's finally earned it, all that sort of talk about also implementing a culture, all that sort of thing, whatever that means. I just hope that I really liked his comment, actually, about that fun outcry where he was like, listen, I'm not talking about fun as in going to an amusement park. Yeah. Like, chill. Um well, yeah, because all all the reporters, right, they were at, they were like, oh, because they have Daryl syndrome where they think like the – the uh coming to the rink should be an amusement park like they were so enamored when ward was playing pra- music and handball in practice and like all the questions were like how are you gonna get the players oh the players need to have so much fun and he's like well not really well they don't the professional sports guys and yeah i mean i'm i'm also in the wait and see camp but i'm more inclined to want to be excited about it than not just even given the past track record like this is this is not healthy it's <laughs> The no, it isn't. Track record. No, it isn't. Telling me the evidence does not back it up, and I'm just like, 
Kool-Aid. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to feel bad for you when you're, when it's, you know, two years into this and it's like, what a mess. And you're, uh, I'm going to say, I told you, but well, I didn't tell you. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you're making like a pros and cons list, it's like, yeah, I, I agree with you, right? Like his track record in the organization, I think is important. And I think that's maybe kind of what distinguished him from, from Mitch Love. And I mean, Conroy kind of said as much pretty straightforwardly. And that was kind of my thing too. It was like, you know, like Mitch seems like the shiny new toy type type of guy, but like, and I heard Conroy talk about this as like, and I totally agree. It's like going from AHL to NHL, even as an assistant is like, so it's so, it's so different. It's such a different beast that I think throwing Mitch Love into this situation, which, you know, last year was a bit of a shit, throwing him into a shit show would be, would be probably not great for anybody. Right. Um, so uh, the fact he's worked with guys like Rasmus Sanderson, Oliver Shillington, like you're saying, I, I've seen people say this too, like, oh, we shouldn't have hired another defensive coach. I think that to me is a huge, a huge plus, a huge plus that he, you know, like he he has, not only has he been in charge of the defense and in charge of the penalty kill and has really improved the penalty kill um, and under Daryl Sutter really improved how this team plays, how this team defends and checks in its own zone. Um learning from Daryl Sutter. I know some people think that's bullshit. I think that's huge. I think that's awesome. Whatever you think of Daryl, like a lot of his tactics are tried, true, and he's a great hockey mind. So I think that's a huge plus for me. And I mean, a, a lot of guys, cause I remember this with Bill Peters, right? Like he came in and implemented that like high flying system. Hey, hey, that was awesome to watch. Right. Like that was great, but they didn't really play defense and they got absolutely murdered in not even that they didn't play defense. They didn't check very well. They weren't very good defending and they got absolutely run over by the Colorado avalanche. Right. So I think it's kind of easy if you're a coach and you want to come in and like, you know, get everybody on board and be like, Oh, we're going to be this high flying offensive team. We're just going to score, 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 score. It's like, yes, but then the playoffs come. And when does that ever work? Like, look at the Oilers, look at all the high flying, super skilled teams who, not that they're bad at defense, but who just won the cup? It's like Vegas. They have a great blue line. They're monsters at defending. You know, they play that really tight checking type of hockey. Um, so I think having a guy who does have a sound grasp of the defensive end of the game and has a sound philosophy and a coherent philosophy and a philosophy that he wants to push onto the team of defense um, is really important. Um, so that's a plus for me. Another pro is, like you said, he does seem to have at least somewhat confidence in his own ability. And, you know, I think that probably comes with the fact that he does have, at least in, in junior, like a winning pedigree. Not an elite pedigree, but like the guy has won. He won a WHL championship with Kelowna in like 2009. And I think as an assistant coach at Kelowna, he went to the Memorial Cup like three or four, maybe even five times in his career there. It's like, I kind of want this. I, I, I feel like this, like you're saying, like this might be different than a Gullitson or or a Ward for sure. Where it's like, yeah, this is just a guy who's never really proven to anyone that he's anything other than like a, an amateur or like subpar at any level, and he might actually be like actually qualified to do this. And yeah. in saying that, like you know, going from the eight. Becoming going from NHL assistant coach to NHL full coach is a bridge a lot of guys can't cross. So that'll be the next test to see if he can do it. Because again, like then the one other thing, like a lot of what he's saying is does ring true and sounds really good. But I think I think what you're realizing with with NHL coaches and why there is such a um, you know, because everybody like, and I, of course, I think this is true. Like, oh, the old boys club is like, how many times is Peter Laviolette going to coach another team in the Metro, even let alone in the league? Like, it's just this, everybody, the retreads, like the same few guys. Why doesn't anybody new get a chance? And I think, I think that question is valid, but I also think that it's just, it's really, it's really fucking hard to be a coach in the national hockey, a head coach in the national hockey league. And it's really hard to be a good coach and it's really hard to get results. And even when you do get results, it's such a fickle business. It's like, look at Calgary. Even we have two instances where our coach wins, wins coach of the year and then is fired the next season. Like it's insane. It is the hardest job in the sport. And I don't even think it's close, right? Like as a day to day, you, you, you get all, you take all of the blame and get none of the credit when you win or lose. It's just such a hard job. So 
I think that's kind of why you see so many guys like go from not being able to make it either, whether they're going from the AHL to the NHL or they're going from assistant to head coach. It's just, it's so hard. It's so hard. Um, so having ideas and, and, and having philosophies in practice, I mean, that's great, but like then implementing them at the NHL level and getting the results out of your team that you need is like, that's a huge challenge. So it's like, now the real work begins for Husky. I was like, okay, dude, like you, you want this job? Here you go. Like this is, it's the hardest job. It's probably the hardest job in sports. Like it's insane how hard it is for an NHL coach to be an NHL coach. And that's why you see, you know, guys get rehired all the time. Cause it's like, well, he can at least do it. So um, that's going to be a huge challenge for him. And I hope he can do it, but yeah, I, th I think he has the tools to do it, but man, Saying, thinking you can do it, having the ideas to do it, it's a lot different than doing it. So we'll see. Yeah. I guess like, it's like the Anakin Skywalker quote, like the, yeah. this, where the fun begins. Like this is literally yeah. where we're at. Like just wait until it's like game 56 in February or, Jan or January. And it's like, you have to push a group of 23, like, multi-millionaire athletes to like win a game in Columbus on a Thursday night. It's like, that's tough. And then you think that's tough. Then you get into like round one and two and three of the playoffs. And it's just like, it's just, man, it's a hard job. And like, Hey, if you screw up, you're probably fired. You know, that dream job you've worked your entire life for. Hey, two bad years, especially in Calgary, <laughs> two bad yeah. years. You're probably gone. And yeah. it's like, man, it's so much pressure and it's so hard. And, like, I kind of want to feel a little optimistic in, in regards to, like, the offense and the offensive capability that he could bring just because yeah. of the comment that he brought up when he was talking about that series with Colorado, how he straight up was like, we were fast, they were faster. That was the difference. Yeah. It's not, oh, they were fast. Let's be, let's be bold and slow. And It's not what Bill Peters tried to do, which was like, oh, shit. We have to, you know, completely abandon our offense and just like clog up the neutral zone and not skate anymore. It's like it's not that. If you can if if you can create a balance where the guys up front are able to play quick transitionally, yeah, and able to generate, and then guys in the back end, when there's an opportunity to start transition, they can jump on it. And when you need to be tight defensively, they can do it which in a perfect world sounds like the perfectly run team. But if you can get to even half of a success rate of managing both ends that way, we're probably going to have more success than not. So, Dude, if, dude, if you played last season with this same team, like a million, like what's the, what's Dr. Strange in Endgame? 14 million, 605. If you played this season, 14 million, 605 times, like this would be the only one where all this crazy, insane shit happened, where we set all kinds of awful records for losing games by one goal or hitting posts or our best player having the worst drop-off in NHL history or our Vesna-nominated goalie dropping, like, 10, like, into sub-900 save percentage points. Like, even, <laughs> even a slight adjustment is, in theory, going to make this team at least a playoff team next year. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, I agree. Like, if he can make a few tweaks. And, I mean, the things he did mention tactically, um, I, I, just listening to him do his, like, media circuit, I think he said it in the press conference, just the things I picked up on most were um, correcting the big defensive breakdowns in the D zone, which, yeah, I think that's, I think that was kind of, that's kind of part and parcel with, with how Sutter you know, has had the flames playing in their own zone is like that really aggressive shot suppression. Try to keep shot volume down, like suppress shots at all costs, like get the puck back immediately, play that kind of like five tight everywhere the puck is and try to get the puck back. Like when you're doing that, and especially when you're not used to playing structured defense like that, if you're a guy like Weger or Huberto or Kadri even, or any of the new guys, it's like, that leads to a lot of those like out of the blue grade A scoring chances, which, you know, if you watch the flames this year, that's kind of what tended to happen. It was like, well, we outshot them like 50 to 10, but they had seven high danger scoring chances and we had five. That's weird. It's kind of like, 
I think that kind of like strict adherence to reducing shot volume did kind of lead to some some big defensive breakdown. So I think if he can kind of fix that, I think that'll help. And I think like I was listening to him talk on a podcast interview from a couple, maybe a couple months ago or a month ago. You probably listened to it just mostly about the penalty kill and his thoughts about the penalty kill. And if you have, if, if, if you wanted to kind of get some glimpse into Huska's philosophies, I recommend you go listen to it. I think it's off the glass podcast or something, Mm -hmm. but yeah, he was just talking about like Vegas adjusting to Edmonton's power play in the playoffs and them just realizing that, Hey, we can't be so aggressive against these guys because they're just going to, if we're aggressive, they're going to get that seam pass to dry settle and they're going to score every single time. So we kind of have to back off a little bit. And I mean, you know what, now that I think about it in retrospect, I think that's probably kind of why the Flames did have such a hard time with the Oilers and probably with like really skilled teams over the last year and a half is that, you know, when you're playing that that low shot volume type of game and you're adhering to that and you're suppressing shots at all costs and you're just trying to get the puck back in the D zone is like when you're playing against really skilled teams who can make really skilled plays like... McDavid and Dreisaitl can expose you on some of those plays if if you're being too aggressive. And, you know, like that happened to the Flames so bad in that in that series against the Oilers. And it happened a lot last year. So I think if he can fix that, I'm glad he mentioned that because I think that was a was an issue this year. And then obviously, you know, I, I know everybody is obsessed with the offensive side of it five on five. I'm not as worried about that. I never had a big problem with that. I don't think the Flames were that bad five on five offensively this year, as everyone claims. Like, sure, I know they favored shot the shot quantity over shot quality a lot, and they're, you know, like I know that's frustrating for people. But at the end of the day, like they ended up score they scored at like I think a top ten rate per sixty minutes at five on five in the league. It, to me, the big issue offensively was the power play. Right, that was the biggest issue, and <laughs> I heard that in his in his second interview he had like a big presentation and one of the main parts was like trying to fix the power play oh and kirk muller's not coming back so the fact he was talking about you know fixing the big defensive breakdowns and fixing the power play those you know what those those are two big adjustments that need to be made i don't think he's reinventing the wheel like again like i think people get too bogged down in like because most nhl teams play pretty similar styles right with slight variations on what they do so like removing daryl and putting husk in isn't going to like just change the the paradigm of how the calgary flames play i think he's going to carry a lot over a lot of those same strategies and tactics with a few tweaks but if he can if he can fix those huge defensive breakdowns and and you know eh, sorry i'm going on a total rant here but it's like even i remember talking to kevin woodley who is a goalie analyst who was really close to the canucks and with jacob markstrom specifically and he was like, he was worried about Markstrom coming, like Sutter coming to the Flames um, with Markstrom and Ned, because he was like, yeah, Markstrom actually does better in a system that allows a lot of perimeter shots and allows him to feel the puck and, and play the puck a lot, a lot of low danger chances, as opposed to like how the Flames play, which is like, you're not getting anything, but then that inevitably leads to some massive defensive breakdown sometimes. And he, yeah, we sure saw that this year, right? It was like, he would let like man oh man so hopefully that helps marstrom as well hopefully that's more of like an upstream solution to the goaltending or whoever's in net um but yeah if you can fix those huge defensive breakdowns and score like 10 more goals on the power play you're gonna be fine and i mean that's the thing with huberto too right i don't think it was because um Daryl wasn't like allowing him to do anything five on five. I think maybe part of that, but the biggest issue to me is like the power play was not allowing him to do anything. They had him standing in front of the fucking net for like 20% of this the year on the power play. Like this is a guy who what last five years up till now, only dry and McDavid had more power play points than him. So that's, that's, I think will be a huge fix for Huberto. Cause like, let's say if Huberto has, Let's say he finished the season with with twenty more power play points. You would you would have won the division with twenty more power play points from that guy. So um, again, add those to the pros. I'm, I'm glad he addressed those things. Um, I think those will that was encouraging. Technically, we won't really know until we actually start seeing the product. Yeah, in regards to a somewhat of an emphasis on quality over quantity at both ends, like reducing quality chances against 
increasing quality chances for that should be the paradigm yeah what you're trying to achieve yeah i think the possession game obviously I, i'm a big fan of that kind of game like i still think you see that that kind of like uh game that like carolina plays win out a lot of the time over over time um but i mean obviously you can't be putting up 600 shot attempts and having like five high danger scoring chests. and i mean that does kind of reflect on on the personnel more so i think this year because they played the same way with Gaudreau and Kachuk and those guys leave. And I think that was an underestimated factor as to why the Flames weren't as good this year with that same system. But you have to adjust to the guys you have, and they didn't really do that. I do appreciate that they're both Conroy and Huska both seem to be very like honest and just like <laughs> direct. Um you don't miss you don't miss the metaphors, the mystic food metaphors about like milk and soup. Like, like, I do miss Daryl telling the media to piss off for sure, but I don't miss Brad like in his dumb word salad press conferences. I know, I know Daryl's press conferences aren't for everybody, but they sure were for me. They were, yeah, they were honestly like the entertainment value in those things. Oh, yeah. Whether you loved or hated them, like, I would just sit there and be like, did he just say that? Like, light the lamp during the NHL playoffs with DraftKings Sportsbook. New customers can make a $5 bet and score $200 in bonus bets instantly. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code THPN. That's code THPN only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. In Massachusetts, call 800-327-5050 or visit gamblinghelplinema.org. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY 467-369. In Kansas, call 1-800-522-4700. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort, must be 21 years of age or older in most eligible states, but age varies by jurisdiction. Eligibility restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com sportsbook for details and state-specific responsible gambling resources. Bonus bets expire seven days after issuance. Eligibility and deposit restrictions apply. Terms at sportsbook.draftkings.com slash hockey terms. So I guess let's get into the rumors around Noah Hannafin. Yeah, I just turned on Flame Talk this afternoon, and Steinberg was saying, like, from what he's heard, uh, you know, Hannafin is still unsure about his future in Calgary, and he didn't say it's a strong likelihood he'll be traded, but he was he the way he was described it made it sound like yeah, trade could very possibly happen. Which kind of surprised me to be honest, because I've kind of been leaning that way about Lindholm. Like I think everybody knows. It's been my feeling Lindholm's had one foot out the door ever since last summer, and this awful season was just the nail in the coffin. But Hannafin does surprise me a little bit, especially because like since he since he's gotten here, he's molded into a way better player than when he came in. Oh yeah, I remember that first year he was here, yeah. and it was just like an absolute. T- him and Travis Hamonic were like, oh, just nightmare fuel every time they were on the ice. They were so bad defensively. And I mean, like, Hannafin eats up a lot of minutes. And, like, I just wonder about what sort of return they would be looking at. Like, I would hope that it's prospects and picks. That's, like, the r- normal rationale. But we're mm-hmm. also Flames fans, so we can't expect that. Um, so, Eric could Branson and Eric could Branson back and, like, <laughs> Boone Jenner or something. Oh, my God. Yeah, like, I... I'm just kind of worried about the gamble that it m- could perceive because you're also banking on Shillington being right exact same form that he was yeah. a ago and he hasn't played in over a year. Yeah. Um so yeah, I don't know. I I I like Hannafin. I get that a lot of people it's like the TJ Brody shit. Like a lot of people like TJ yeah. Brody's game. A lot of people were like, "Oh God!" Like, get, he's get terrible. Him. Yeah, he's makes a huge mistake all the time. Yeah, like over a course of an eighty-two game season, you're not going to be perfect. There are going to be nights where you're going to look like a bonehead when you play twenty-five minutes a night. Like it's kind of entrenched in the rationale. But um, I don't know. I guess we'll see what the return ends up being. Yeah. I, yeah, like I, I like I've never been a huge Hannafin guy. He's actually surprised me over the last few years, and like I think having Daryl Sutter, you know, help him on the defensive side of the game has been huge for him. Um, like I was never a believer, 
you know, like again, watching him those first two years, it was like this guy and everyone oh, he hasn't hit his potential yet. It's like, he's played 400 NHL games. When's he going to hit his potential? But yeah, he has got in- incrementally better, like almost every single year, probably. Um, I think to me, like the, the only thing that I'm like, if, if he doesn't want to resign, then yeah, trade him. Or if he wants to resign and he wants way too much money, yeah, trade him because like, is he the third best defenseman on this team? Probably. I think we've kind of got to a point where we used to overrate him and now we're underrating him though. Yeah. So it's like, I, I think it would be, you know, and again, you can't just slot Shillington in there, even though I do think Shillington's good. It's like, that's always a, that's always a risky game, you know, to be like, Oh, well, this guy's expendable now because this guy might be good. It's like, well, you never really know. And dealing 26 year old defenseman is, you know, could be risky, my question is more like I'm fine to do that deal if it makes sense for the team and they're doing it as a futures deal, you know, and not like, oh, we're going to make a lateral move, like trading Hannafin one for one for like a forward who's like 27, 28, 29, 30, you know, who can like come in and help right away next year. Like, I'm not really interested in that. The Flames need to get younger. They need to get players who are team controlled and cost controlled, most importantly. So you want to be trading for somebody younger than Hannafin. Um, but my question is like, okay, like, I wish I was hearing more like, hey, Chris Tanev is on the block or 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 Tyler Toffoli is on the block type deals. You know what I mean? Because it's just like, of all, you, and I guess of all your trade assets, Hannafin probably is the most valuable. I understand that. But then he's also the most valuable to you. It's like, I'd rather move out older guys and then maybe try to keep Hannafin if, if it were up to me. But if he doesn't want to sign, that's a different story. But you know what? Like, I, I just hope it's not like, yeah, we're trading Hannafin for uh, making a lateral move and we're going to be ready to roll next year with like another group of 27, 28, 29 year olds. So you just hope they get somebody like, like what did Provorov get? The flame should be getting way more than what Philly got for Provorov. His Hannafin's better than Provorov. His, his current AAV is an absolute steal. If you're a contending team and you can slot Noah Hannafin into your, into your lineup at under $5 million, like that's a huge, that'd be huge. So he should get at least, what at least more than what Provorov got. Like I look back and see what the flames gave up for Hamannick. And it's like, you should probably be able to get a first in two seconds, at least for Noah Hannafin. If that's, if that was the going rate for Travis Hamannick back in the day. So that's what I, the kind of the, the market I'd be looking for. Um, but yeah, I, I, I would resign of all the guys they have on, on the table to like possibly resign. He would be the one I would be most interested in retaining. In regards to, I guess now that we just brought it up, pending UFAs, let's play a game called Trader Sign. I'm going to list all of them, and we're just going to label TRS yeah. as, as predictions. I've got a full T book right here. I'm doing all T's, I think. Lindholm. Trade. <laughs> Toffoli. Trade. Well, trade. You, yeah, trade. Hannafin. Likely. Trade. Well, it's, well re- I'll, I'll put him as my resign. Yeah. And of course, he's the one that's going to get traded. One's going to get dealt. Yeah. Um, Backlund. I, I would trade him, man. Tanev. I would trade him. Zadorov. I would trade him. And then Oliver Shillington, who you'll probably... I will, I will resign him for sure. Yeah. And like, I mean, I'll put asterisks on those guys. I don't know how you feel, um, but I would put asterisks on like if Backlund wants to come back at a very fair number. It's just like... You're never going to have a oppor- better opportunity to get more from Michael Backlund than you are right now, you know? So maybe Backlund's the one who is like, hey, star, you're keeping him around because he's a lifelong flame and he, you know, he maybe is going to be the captain. If he wants to come back at a at a friendly deal, I'm fine with that. But I mean, Toffoli and Tana, Toffoli especially, it's like, and I love the guy and he was absolutely phenomenal and losing him would probably be huge. It was like, is he ever going to play better than he played this year under a coach who has historically gotten the most out of him at age. What is he? 31, 32. He's never going to play better. And you're telling me a team like Carolina, who is like, just saw that they need a, a, a legit goal scorer in the playoffs. Wouldn't give you a nice, like, come on. That to me is, and, and Tanf too. It's like, he has been a warrior and been way, has earned his contract way more than I thought he ever would. But it's like, He's on the verge of falling apart. It's like if anybody wants him for fair value, like I would be trading him. Anything you can get for those guys at this point, I would be because again, you're gonna run into this problem is like because everyone's like, oh, you can trade him at the trade deadline. Well, what if you're good? 
again, right? Like you're you're just setting yourself up for another scenario where it's like, oh, well, we can't trade those guys. And I mean, you don't have to trade everybody. Like Carolina is really good at this, right? It's like they will use a player to his utility and then just let him go. But they don't do it with like everyone and all the core members of their team and then like not recoup assets. They can do that because they have a great prospect pool and a shit ton of draft capital and a lot of ways to fill those. The Flames don't have any of that. So it's like when you, you when you lose Gaudreau, let's say you lose five of those guys. And it's like, then you lost Geo, Gaudreau, Toffoli, Backlund, Zadorov, like for nothing. Like that's not a recipe for building, which is what I, I would hope, the, which is what they're claiming to be in a phase of is, is more of building. So trade them all, trade them, trade every one of them. And I think like the hard part with that for me is like, there is no better time for you to potentially retool the entire yeah. future of your team than with the situation that is literally being handed to you on a silver platter in between with how deep this draft class is. Yeah, exactly. And the fact that half your team is expiring and yeah, they're all big, big pieces. Like we lose Lindholm. Okay. That is marginally damaging for the next few years. Cause it's like, Who's your top line center? You don't yeah. have one. Mm -hmm. um, so you're just like, okay, let's just pray and hope that we don't get absolutely wrecked at the dot for two years. But opposite side of that is what you would get out of a deal for Lindholm at yeah, exactly. And they should be prioritizing adding more first rounders this summer. 100%. Oh my God. Because I, you could have your cake and eat it too this year because I think that's kind of the false dichotomy the Flames management and ownership have kind of created where it's other kind of like go for it or rebuild. But then they never really do either. Like they never do what Vegas does. It's like, yeah, we're getting, we're going all out. We're getting Eichel. We're getting Stone. We're getting, like we're going balls out. We're going to do it. They don't ever really go all in. They just kind of say they want to make the playoffs, but then they never rebuild. It's like, you can do what Carolina does. You can do kind of what I think Colorado's done a really good job at is like both. You can do both at the same time. You can get younger and better for the future and get better right now, especially in today's NHL. It's like, you. The it's funny, like, like look at like just an, kind of an example, maybe a bit of a lateral example, but it's like Nashville at the trade deadline this year. Like they trade everyone and they they give all their kids some time to shine. And they were unbelievable. They almost made the playoffs. It's like you always kind of like overestimate. It's like, well, we can't lose to Foley. We can't lose to Foley. And then if you traded to Foley for like some prospects and put some of your own prospects in there, they maybe could bridge that gap a lot faster than you think. And then in two years time, you're way further ahead than you would have been if you just kept them. You can do both. If you're exactly. smart, like what Conroy alluded to in, in his intro presser, if the emphasis was to put more, you know, reliance on young guys and actually yeah. building through the draft, which is something that clearly pissed him off. I mean, he released all of the guys we selected in 2021, <laughs> like two weeks ago and everyone. Yeah. Um, if that emphasis is there, this is literally like path is wide open. Yeah do that this summer which is why i'm having such a hard time being like yeah let's give lindholm an eight-year deal and then collect the infinity stones of 30 year old exactly now. yeah like let's do that yeah like i'm having a hard time if lindholm is giving you any indication don't even wait till july 1st what are you doing yeah. wait until july 1st so that you can start the negotiation if you have yeah. any sort of idea that he's not going to stay the draft just do it. Yeah, you you don't have to choose one of the, you don't have to be Chicago and just be like you don't have to tank, right? Like yeah. smart like how has Boston made the playoffs like so many years in a row or like how Colorado has built it. Like you look at that do like Lindholm could kind of make a Lindholm trade could maybe be like it probably would never work out as good as the Duchesne trade did for Colorado, but it's like they traded a core piece of their team and it turned them into a Stanley Cup a perennial like it got them kale like was that the bowen byram trade did it get them kale mccart too i can't remember the matthew shane trade was just an absolute boon for joe Sackey because he was doing both he was like and i mean they were at a bit of a different crossroads but you can do both if you're smart about it and i mean if conroy really means what he says and i hope that he does but if he like signs lindholm to a huge 80 million dollar deal i'll have to question it a little bit 
Um, but it's right. Yeah. Like you're saying the path that you claim you want to take is right there. You just have to, you just have to be brave enough to go down it. Right. You have to be like, yeah, we're trading Lindholm, you know? And I think that's maybe something Brad was never super good at because everyone's always ballsy. He was ballsy. It was like, well, he always kind of got into these situations that like would force him to make trades. He never made like a proactive trade. So he traded Dougie Hamilton because Dougie Hamilton didn't show up to the exit interviews and didn't want to be on the team anymore. You know, he traded Matthew Kachuk because he asked for a trade. Like all his big ballsy moves were like, you were kind of forced to do that. If you're Conroy, it's time to start being proactive and shaping this team into the team you want it to be. And I don't think any of us want it to be a team where you're paying Huberto, Kadri, Lindholm, and a bunch of 30 year old, a bunch of players, 30 combined million dollars into their 30s. Take action, Craig. Get on it. Like that, that's where I'm at too. Like it's not even that. Whenever people you have these conversations with people, they're like, "Why do you hate Lindholm?" It's like, "When did oh, I?" Hate Lindholm? I've been nailed to the cross for hating Lindholm because, like, I had the audacity to say, "Like, he's not as good as Johnny Gaudreau," and it's like, yeah, I kind of think he's proven that with like how many times has he scored? Like, his two best seasons were with Gaudreau, and otherwise, he's been like a really good player, but not a player I want to pay ten. Like, what's he going to get? I'm Horvat money. He's going to get Hor. He's going to ask me. He's gonna ask and probably deserve Horvat money. Flames can't do that. That's like that's the crossroads that I think it's gonna be. Yeah, and that will yeah see how that's maneuvered because that will tell us everything. Yeah, whatever yeah. direction that the organization takes, and by direction I don't mean rebuild or stay competitive. I mean mm-hmm. like in terms of on ice personnel and the age bracket that you have guys locked up to. That's going to determine the next decade of this franchise, really. Yeah, like if you're going to lock yourself into like a San Jose type situation, if yeah. you if you do like say, oh, we can't lose these guys, we have to sign them. Like that's what you're setting yourself up for. Mm-hmm. And hey, maybe you see returns next year, but you better di- you better win the Stanley Cup, otherwise you turn into the San Jose Sharks, right? Yeah. Like man, and we we yeah. That's kind of what it was like this year. It was like, we were all excited. We were like, who cares about the future, man? Because we're going to win the cup this year. And we stunk. And we were all kind of like, oh, yeah, maybe we should have <laughs> thought a little harder about committing all this money to these guys. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it'll be it'll be very interesting to see how this is maneuvered. I'm honestly a little worried. Yeah. Like, I'm not going to lie. I'm kind of... I like the more I hear about guys that are, is this guy going to stay? Is that going to go? They had that piece in the athletic, like Pierre Lebrun was like all seven guys wanted out. I'm like, okay, pause. I refuse to believe that Toffoli and Zadorov and Tanev are three of those seven. But yeah. the fact that we're even talking about four out of the seven is just insane. Yeah. Exactly. Like, and that they're mostly, they're all under contract for another year too. Yeah. Importantly. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's gonna be very interesting to see what transpires. I'm 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 pretty worried, but I guess I'm just gonna dude worry. at this point I'm like well I'm worried that they're gonna stay the course and kind of just like do you no know, like sign Lynn. Not that that would be the worst thing in the world, but like I, I'm worried they're gonna go the safe route rather than the route they should go, which is like buyer sale, we're totally changing the direction of this franchise and how we do business. Like maybe Craig pulls a rabbit out of his hat and like trades Markstrom and then signs Lindholm. Hey, I'd be into that. Sure. It's all about cap allocation. Where are you allocating your dollars? Exactly. It's all, it's all, yeah. If you're going to pay Lindholm eight and a half, don't, don't. Oh, at least. Six million dollar goalie. Yeah. That's, that's where I'm at. Like, yeah. I would not be the GM of this team. Use your, yeah, I know. Well, dude, like Brad, just like, it's so funny because like everybody was like, when Brad quit, they're like, oh, he's going to take a year off. He was obviously just fed up with the ownership meddling is like, he couldn't get away from this ship. He was obviously what happened when he was like, oh shit, I better, I better bounce before I have to deal with this. (laughs) It's like, yeah, I feel you for the first time, Brad, I feel you. If you guys like the discussion, feel free to hit the like button not subscribe button go check out the in the dome podcast as well but yeah thanks for listening everyone